copyright. Um, I'm Fiona Fieldsend, I'm the Digital New Zealand Services Manager and copyright and open licensing is close to my heart. Um, and it's kind of obvious to say that copyright licensing has been long a challenge, a headache, a worry, a barrier to progress in the glam sector. Digital technologies, as we all know, because we're at this conference, offer amazing opportunities, but also really tricky problems for our sector. Uh, society's expectations about accessing their information, their culture and their heritage have changed and licensing of materials, licensing of the materials we hold is a ubiqu ubiquitous question that our sector circles around. For those of you that might not be familiar with the concept of open glams, it's a set of proposals that encourage the use of Creative Commons and other open licenses and rights statements to allow for easier access and reuse of our collections and it was actually right here at the very first NDF in 2002, May 2002, that the, the first kernel of open glams formed in New Zealand, the New Zealand kernel of open glams, that is. In that first forum, the questions were, uh, it raised the question of open access to online information, transparency of copyright and intellectual property issues. It broached indigenous uh, copyrights or indigenous rights. It also put on the table the importance of copyright law needing to strike a balance between the rights of the owners and the needs of our users. Those issues all seem quite familiar still, don't they? So every year since then I know that copyright and lic licensing has been a dominant, <laughs> a dominant theme woven through NDF. Uh, and since then there have been leaps and bounds across the New Zealand sector and around the world. There's now more acceptance of open licensing of our collections, but trying to show and communicate the value of opening up digital collections for reuse continues to be a challenge. Fortunately, evidence of the benefits are, are, are coming through loud and clear. And I'm gonna play a trailer for a study called The Impact of Open Access on Galleries, Libraries, Museums and Archives that was presented at South by Southwest this year on um, open access programs in galleries uh, for libraries, archives and museums.
So with that as a little bit of inspiration, I'm delighted to, to introduce you to today three Kiwi movers and shakers in this important space. And so we've got Sarah Powell. Kia ora. She's the Rights Specialist at Auckland War Memorial Museum. She recently, while working full-time, full -time, I might add, completed her Masters, sorry, her Museum Studies thesis towards a connected commons. And I can assure you that it's freely accessible online and it's CC, CC by. by. Yeah. <laughs> Kim Gutschlag is the Manager of Collection Development and Description at the National Library and she's also a member of the Leander Standing Copy Standing Committee for Copyright. She really knows her stuff. And today you're going to see Kim flipping hats because she'll be answering and responding to questions from those two different contexts. And last, but by no means least, we have Victoria Leachman, the Rights Manager at Te Papa. Did I have the right title? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, since 2008, I've watched Victoria make extraordinary progress in this institution that you're sitting in. And Victoria's going to kick off proceedings with a short summary of the issues that were raised at the Copyright Workshop earlier this week on Monday. <clears throat> After that, we'll work through a series of questions that we've prepared, and then we'll be opening the floor to your burning questions about copyright and licensing. Okay, so you know who I am. Um, when Sarah and I were talking about doing a workshop for um, NDF, um, we were thinking about the copyright talks and the workshops we'd actually run with various communities because um, we're often asked either to do it for other GLAM institutions or community groups. Um, and we've both had a lot of feedback telling us that the last 10 minutes of question and answers is actually the most valuable part of those um, those presentations we've done. So our thought was to run a workshop that was all about the specific questions that people have and need answering to do their work. So the workshop was um, run on a lean coffee format. Everybody in the room had their question, put their questions on post-it notes, then had five votes each, and the questions were ranked by popularity and we started with the most popular. We ran two question and voting sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and uh, the group shared their views on a large number of questions. So I'm going for the most popular and sort of cutting it off because we haven't got a lot of time to do the whole thing again. The first and uh, most popular bundle of questions was about copyright and social media use. Attendees were interested in how each institution in the room handled content on these platforms. There were concerns held by some about the broad licensing that social media platforms require from users before users can load content. Some institutions don't actually allow the use of content on these platforms because of that broad licence that's required. There was also discussion about institutions collecting images posted by others on Facebook and other um, platforms and the steps needed to check both the content ownership and the copyright status of that content before collecting it. And there was discussion about social norms of reuse and sharing on social media platforms and the gap between that behaviour and the current copyright law. If you collect via a social media platform, I think the, the message was that we make sure that the person posting the work was actually the owner of the work and to try and find out as much information on the maker as possible so um, you could get the copyright uh, information established. Uh, there was a great diversity of approaches to posting content on social media platforms with each institution really deciding how much risk was acceptable to them. Um, there was also discussion on whether GLAMs have responsibility to tell others when we believe they've infringed copyright when posting content to social media. Um, some institutions did that, others didn't. Uh, the second most popular question was are all around orphaned works and what could be considered a reasonable and diligent search. There's no New Zealand standard to due diligence. Um, those that do this work advise that the best approach was based on the type of work that they were looking at, and because the places you look for information on the rights holders will change depending on the type of work that you're dealing with. We talked about how much effort and investment it takes to chase down every single lead to try and find a copyright holder. Some works will take very little effort because so little is known about the maker, and others will take hours, and if not days, of time if there are good clues to who the copyright holder might be and you're just having trouble contacting them. Uh, Sarah uh, shared her checklists of the places where she looks for copyright holder contact information and there was also discussion on what different institutions did with orphaned works, specifically whether they published them online and took the risk or whether they just left them. Um, generally, there was an agreement that adopting a risk assessment approach tailored to your institution was the best approach, but only after a diligent search was well documented. 
The third question was about other types of rights, donor rights, kaitiaki rights, rights of people within photographs. The group talked about the differences in approach to handling these types of rights, and there was definitely no consistent approach in the room. Everybody seems to do this differently. What was common theme was that supporting relationships was both time consuming and rewarding. The feeling was building and maintaining long-term relationships was more valuable than asserting the institution's rights if those rights were in conflict with what the other party wanted. Then there was Creative Commons licensing, specifically questions on when can the licensing be used. For example, you can't use a Creative Commons copyright license on a work that's out of copyright. What do people do when they see Creative Commons licenses being misused? How do you convince others it's a good idea to use Creative Commons licensing, particularly with user-generated content? Those interested in adopting Creative Commons licensing were encouraged to talk to the Creative Commons um, Aotearoa staff, Keitha and Elizabeth. They have resources specifically tailored for GLAMS and would be really happy to run workshops for the sector or for just your institution. When thinking about specific projects, for example, encouraging user developed content, the advice was also to talk to other institutions who've done similar projects to help with your approach. Uh, the fate of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement here in New Zealand and the Copyright Act amendments was discussed. At the time, um, Trump hadn't put his latest um, news article out, so um, at the what we thought was that it was likely, and it's proved to be true, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement will not go ahead. There was a feeling that the copyright term extension was likely to occur at some later date anyway. Um, the conversation continued and we discussed the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment and their creative um, sector study, which is due out sometime in December at this rate. Um, the copyright policy advisors there are still keen to hear of real world examples of where, where we have copyright issues in our sector. Uh, there was also a question about end use and what users can do to encourage GLAMs to release digitised content openly. The main message there was to write to or make an appointment with senior management and provide concrete examples of, the, of issues and barriers faced by our users. It was clear there were staff and organisations advocating for more open licensing of content, but that direct content with, contact with senior management by use, end users might also have an um, influential effect. And another, one of the final questions was, how can GLAMs support copyright holders? Should we be giving them guidance? There was recognition across the room that a portion of copyright holders felt out of depth with dealing with copyright. A lot of people who own these rights don't know the market rates in terms of licensing fees, are unsure of their ground regarding their rights. Those responding had a common theme of wanting to help those who are unsure of their rights, but at the same time not wanting to bias the copyright holder's response. There was a recognition of the conflict of interest in the room. We also discussed problems with the current Copyright Act. For libraries, copyright was a barrier to mass digitisation projects, but also the, the current Copyright Act does deal, do, doesn't deal well with orphaned works, copying for preservation, data mining, and other transformative uses. Galleries and museums would benefit from the expansion of the library exceptions to cover them. There was mention of Australia's work on importing the Fair Use Clause from the USA, and that's the link down the bottom. Um, I've included a link to the Australian Law Reform Commission's report, which was mentioned. The group also discussed the need for consistency across the GLAM sector with rights statements. The rights statements of the Digital Public Library of America were discussed, and there was recognition that rights state statements could be standardised to a restricted set of statements within the database, but that um, making it that... Uh, be able to be interpreted by your users probably in, uh, would involve an extra step, an extra explanation. Uh, because right statements are inherently confusing to the public unless they're totally spelled out. Um, for example, the example that came up in the room was the difference. There is a, there is a di difference between the no-known copyright restrictions statement and a public domain rights statement. But I don't think a user at the end of that is actually going to see the difference between that. Sort of, Those people who are working with copyright will know, but it's so minute that um, they won't get it. Uh, so the solution was to reflect specific situation of the, in the rights st statements in the back-end database but then bundle them together in a useful way for your user on your platform. Um, we also discuss, we discussed our, the way we record our rights research and our licensing records.
Right, we're going to kick off with some prepared questions. Um, and the first one's actually about data. <clears throat> and is your organisation making progress on opening up and releasing its collections metadata? Who'd like to kick off with that one? How about you, Sarah? Um, yep, so I'm just going to be completely honest. I don't deal with that side of things. Um, we have Adam Moriarty that deals with that. Um, and he's told me, he's assured me that our metadata is CC BY. Although talking to Fee, um, our metadata on Digital NZ still needs to be updated to reflect that. So we're going to be talking to him after this. <laughs> um, and, but, um, it's completely open, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and we're also moving, we've fully embraced linked open data as well. So um, yeah, that's really good. So that's us. Um, yeah, this is National Library Hat. Um, in 2013, the National Library released the metadata for the New Zealand National Bibliography, Publications New Zealand. Uh, we also, pretty soon after that, released the uh, metadata for Index New Zealand, and they are available from the library's website. They were released under the New Zealand um, Government Open Access and Licensing Framework, the NZ Gold Framework, so they are um, both data sets are under a CC BY license. Earlier this year, we um, closed the Tapuna web directory, a, a long-loved product, but passed its sell-by date. Um, that data um, went out also under the NZ Goal Framework with a CC BY license. Um, for those of you who attended um, Nicholas' talk yesterday, you'll know that very soon, um, before Christmas, we're, um, we'll be making the metadata uh, for the unpublished collections held in the Alexander Turnbull Library available, again, under the NZ Goal Framework with a CC BY license. Um, I understand there's going to be two data sets, one for the unpublished collections metadata and one for the names, so um, watch out for those and enjoy that Christmas present from the Turnbull Library. Um, other National Library metadata, including the Papers Past metadata, is um, made available via the Digital New Zealand API as well. So I think there's re reasonable progress going on there. Yeah. Uh, Te Papa is also making progress. Um, We've got metadata on our collections available now as CSV files, but um, we're actually working on an API pilot project right now, and once that goes into fruition, we'll be looking at New Zealand Goal and releasing it with a Creative Commons license. We're just not sure yet where that's at. We've got to wait till the pilot project finishes. We'll do the backup about licensing. And um, I can talk to Digital New Zealand because they're the ones and we are trying to encourage some media our content partners as possible to consider releasing their metadata for commercial use. So Digital New Zealand, if you've got your metadata, if we've brought your metadata into um, Digital New Zealand, the majority of it is um, for non-commercial use. So if developers use the API, they should only use it for non-commercial use. There is a very fine selection of partners that have um, taken the first step of said it can be used commercially. Um, and we would love for more partners to go in that direction as well. So if you want to talk some more about releasing your metadata for commercial use, then come and see me or email info at digitalnz.org. Okay, <clears throat> the next question. The Creative Sector Study Report from NB due out in late 2016 may recommend that the Copyright Act be reviewed. If the Copyright Act were to be reviewed, what would you want for the glam sector, Victoria? Um, at a minimum, I'd like to see a fair dealing provision for online digital surrogates uh, for collection catalogues. Um, I've, ICOM have got quite a nice uh, list of requests that they um, send through to the World Intellectual Property Office periodically to ask for um, uh, some kind of standardisation between um, the GLAM sector. Um, but that's something that would make my life significantly easier, being able to have put, at least provide access without necessarily having to invest in a significant amount of work, rights research work. That work still needs to get done, but it would be nice to be able to have the ability to um, get information from the rights holder um, in a two-way street kind of way, not me just looking, but they them coming to us and contacting us as well. And unless they can see what that we hold some of their material, um, it's unlikely that that ever happens. Um, I'd also like to see uh, the fair um, dealing provisions associated with libraries expanded to include museums as well. Um, 
we're actually, as a GLAM sector, we all do the same similar types of work, um, and to be excluded from those fair dealing provisions means that there's times that we can't have the same level of service for our users that libraries can provide their users. And given that we're still we're dealing with similar types of information and, and um, knowledge, um, it feels a bit crazy to me that they can do a whole stack that we can't as a museum. Um, now this is another hat one. I'll, I'll swip it, swatch, switch over and put on my Leanza Copyright Committee hat here. Um, I've probably got quite a long answer to this question. To begin with, what we'd like to see to start a, a copyright reform would be a discussion and a, an agreement with the principles that should frame any review of, of copyright law. Um, we have a few thoughts on that, not an exhaustive list, but um, some of the principles we think should be included are acknowledging and respecting authorship and creation and recognising the importance of maintaining incentives for the creation of works. We all have collections that are full of people's intellectual property and creative output and we need to respect that. But, and there's a big but here, alongside that we think there also needs to be a principle acknowledging and respecting that the creation of new works depends on people's ability to access and use existing works and copyright law needs to um, recognise that and support that. Um, we also believe that all people should have access to creative, to enjoy creative works, um, regardless of their situation and their income and all sorts of other things. So, for instance, we'd like that recognised as a principle and the importance of copyright law and policy in facilitating access to people with works by um, with people uh, with disabilities. Uh, we heard a great talk about that yesterday. Mm. Um, as many others um, internationally have commented in these times of ever faster technological development, it's, we think it's really important that the law is technology neutral um, so that it can adapt to new technologies and doesn't hinder technical innovation. Those would be some of our starting principles and we'd like to see those really articulated and agreed in the, in the community. Um, in 2017, the Leanza Copyright Committee is going to survey New Zealand libraries about what they'd like to see in copyright reform. And so while we haven't done that yet, um, we think some of the key things our sector would be looking for in addition to a fair use provision, which we will talk about in a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. I think, um, would include support for mass digitisation by libraries of works in their collections which are no longer commercially available. An orphan works exception in the legislation, our preference is for a wide exception with some fair, reasonable, not punitive way of dealing with library infringement. We don't really support um, a licensing model of the kind that's been used overseas. Um, legislation, making the law easier for people to understand what they can and can't do and what librarians helping, making it easy for librarians to understand what they can and can't do to help their users. Um, no extension to copyright term. Um, ideally, we would like copyright term shortened. Um, we think in terms of an incentive to create 70 years after death that was potentially coming to us after TPPA is, is, is not appropriate, uh, not justified. Um, we recognise that um, it's not just the creator has incentive, you know, that publishing in the whole, um, in the library community, they also encourage creation by the money they get from um, intellectual property, but again, 70 years just seems too long. Um, we'd probably also want, um, you know, to keep exceptions that we currently have that allow us to fulfil our roles and do our jobs, um, like being able to, the library's exception for breaking technological protection measures for, for doing um, authorised acts, um, and uh, the exceptions that we have for um, copying for preservation, although we would like those improved. Uh, I think it's very silly that you have to sort of close off access to the original once you've digitised it, because it's often going to... Um, having a digital version of it is actually going to encourage a lot of people to want to see the original. Um, finally, we recognise that, yes, galleries and um, museums don't currently enjoy the exceptions in the legislation that libraries and archives do, so we'd want to be supporting you to get those as well. Um, so Auckland Museum, um, we've actually submitted against the TPPA, we've written a submission um, with the help of Victoria and um, Kim as well. Um, so we agree that if the TPP goes ahead to extend the copyright duration from death, um, from 50 years to death plus 70 years, 
this is going to create a huge headache, um, lots of orphan works where we can't trace the owners. It's going to involve a lot more work for land professionals in carrying out these due diligence searches. We don't have a due diligence search set kind of template to go by. We just kind of do what we can and hope for the best. Um, so that's probably for us the biggest thing. Um, we, did, we also agree with um, to Papa and Leanza, um, we would like to extend the current provisions for libraries and archives to include museums and public galleries. And again, yes, we all perform very similar roles in preservation and administrative acts, and we would like that to be included. Um, we would also like an orphan works ex exception so we can publish orphan works online and not be at risk of infringing copyright. So. So what's your opinion of a fair use provision and is this something that we should be looking to import from the USA to New Zealand? Do you want to kick off with that one, Kim? Um, yes, again with my Lianza hat on. Um, while we haven't yet surveyed the library sector about that, we uh, think there's quite a lot of support for the introduction of a fair use provision. Um, like others, we see fair use because it's a principles-based approach would provide flexibility to respond to changing conditions, particularly changes in technology. We think that being able to utilise technology to use works in new ways will encourage the creation of new works. Um, we also see fair use as a way to help balance, restore the balance to the copyright system between um, rights holders and users, particularly if there's going to be any extension of term. Um, on the other side, we do acknowledge the arguments against fair use, particularly that it would create uncertainty and could require expensive and lengthy litigation to determine what was fair. But we think the approach to fair use, which um, Victoria put the link up on the um, Australian Law Commission, Law Reform Commission and their paper, uh, Copyright and the Digital Economy, has a lot to recommend it. In that paper, they recommended that Australia's current fair dealing exceptions were repealed and get replaced with fair use. They also recommended that the current fair dealing exceptions um, would um, provide a sort of illustrative list of things that could be considered fair use, along with the, I think they've got four factors that they're thinking about to determine fair use. They felt that that list um, would help um, act as an example of the type of activities that could be um, constitute fair use and could help reduce uncertainty and the need for litigation. Um, I also note that the Australian Productivity Commission, who put out a report this year, and some of you may have read that, uh, about um, intellectual property arrangements, they um, stated they really came out and supported the Australian Law uh, Reform Commission's um, position and actually said that their recommendation on fair use was the absolute minimum level of change that the Australians should be looking to, to enact. So I think there's a lot of support for it um, across Australasia. Um, I think there's a lot of value in adopting it, but I, um, my only issue for me is that reliance on case law and the expense of um, legislation, I mean um, court cases here in New Zealand. Uh, I would say that the if there was some way of making some kind of less expensive court arm to be able to hear these cases so that we can get some case law in place, that I think that would be really useful. Um, at the moment, if you are a, I'm looking at it from a rights holder's perspective um, and you're being infringed, it's incredibly expensive to chase down infringements and make them stop. Um, and it would be good from a, from a, there would be benefits from a rights holder's perspective to be able to have that avenue if it was sort of a small claims court type arrangement, I think. Um, yeah, so for me, I, I, I think it would be a useful, a, a useful thing to have as long as the implementation was, it wasn't just the act changing, they had to look at the whole setup. Um, yeah, I guess if the TPPA goes ahead or even if it doesn't go ahead and copyright duration gets extended, obviously we want to be in line um, to match US and international laws and they all have fair use exceptions so perhaps we should as well but I think that there's a lot more consideration um, and consultation with both institutions and creators um, on how we can have something that's fair for everyone. Um, yeah, so.
Moving on to orphan works, <coughs> how does your institution deal with them? Uh, we do a diligent search, re diligent search and um, so research, research, research. And then we publish online and hope somebody comes forward. Um, and then any time anybody wants to use the orphaned work, we do another diligent search um, and uh, either use it or do a risk assessment approach on whether we use it or not or whether other people use it. We do allow our um, picture library to supply it onto other people. Um, there is a risk there, we recognise that, but at the same time, there's, there's the value of the use is sometimes outweighs it. And like I said, it is a risk um, assessment. There is a great deal of difference between, um, for example, a Pacific item where you don't even know which island group it came from, um, through to an artwork where you know who the artist is, you know where the, you know who the um, inheriting estate, who holds the inheriting estate, but you just can't find them. Um, you know, the, each of those has a different rights assessment where you go, okay, what's the risk here? And you know, you make a judgment call, and you get better with um, experience. Um, National Library hat. Um, currently, the National Library doesn't really have an agreed policy or procedure to handle orphan works, um, but we are starting to develop such an approach. Um, we see the key initial steps as um, the, the definition of what a reasonable search is and um, with different criteria according to the specific kind of work you're looking at, published, unpublished, print, audio, visual. Um, the library um, is currently working on the copyright clearance of broadsheet um, so that this can be digitised and um, through this work we are defining what could be a reasonable search in, um, for copyright holders of published material in a New Zealand context. Uh, another key initial step is establishing a transparent takedown policy mm. for when mm. rights holders turn up. Yep. Um, orphan works are the biggest headache for me. Um, but in saying that, I love them because I love a challenge. So um, Auckland Museum has adapted the copyright undetermined unknown rights holder rights statement um, from the National and State Libraries of Australia. Um, and I follow their guidelines to carry, carry out and record the due diligence search. Um, when I'm actually searching, I start close to home and I check institutional knowledge first. I then search on every digital platform that I can. Uh, Find New Zealand Artists is a really good resource. Other museum websites, I constantly check to Papa's website um, for things so we can share contact um, details if we need to. I then search Ancestry.com, Archway, for probates, uh, births, deaths and marriages, online cenotaph, white pages, a good old Google search, and then if the person is still alive, LinkedIn and Facebook. I do a lot of stalking, it's a bit creepy. Um, <laughs> I stalk a lot of dead people as well. Um, so when I do find a probate on Archway, I have lovely, I actually have two lovely rights research volunteers, and they help me trace the living descendants, um, and we can kind of ask the living descendants about the copyright and if they own the copyright and if they'd be willing to give us a licence. Um, I make sure that we document the search really well and if the work is determined to be an orphan work I then release it under the copyrights under term and rights statement knowing that we have really low risk. We also have a takedown statement on our website as well if they come forward. Um, there is an element of risk in doing this especially for applied arts objects that are more contemporary but it is a good way for the work to be visible and the copyright owner to see the work. If it's online, then they can approach us and we can deal with it from there. So, yeah, that's how we deal with orphan works. So moving on to rights statements. Um, where has your organisation sourced its rights statements from and uh, what's the background to the statements your institution uses and are you thinking of any change? Uh, our rights statements are sourced from New Zealand Goal. We've got three, pretty much, which is um, all rights reserved for anything that has uh, any third party rights associated with it. Uh, for our, the content where we own the copyright, it's the Creative Commons, um, uh, so by non commercial no derivatives, and uh, no known copyright restrictions for anything that's um, in the public domain in here in New Zealand. Um, the change, yes, um, I've been investigating, looking at the 
Digital Public Library of America writes statements. They've got a really nice, diverse um, set of statements which are really interesting to me. I can see them really working for my institution. Uh, I'd like to add more of the Creative Commons licensing in because I want to future-proof my acquisitions process for those times that I can see coming where we want to acquire material that's already been Creative Commons licensed by the creator. Um, at, the, at the moment we've got one item that we can't um, reflect the license of. So, um, yeah, that's it's not quite a pile back there that I need to, that's prompting me to go and change everything, but I'm, I'm fully aware that that's going to influence me. Um, yeah, so, so that's where we're at, yeah, thinking of change. It, the only problem with it is, is that there's a whole lot of programming resource I'll need to scrape out of the digital team and put on my project mm -hmm. in order to get it done. And there's conflicting... Um, yeah, there's, there's, it's finding that resource and getting their feet now to the floor to be able to get them to work on my thing rather than somebody else's thing. Yeah. I think that's next. Right. This is another area where uh, the National Library hasn't been as consistent in our approach as we um, would have liked. And um, for our published collections, we have um, a variety of fairly generic um, statements saying who the copyright owner is, um, noting if reproduction requires their permission, and if the material has a Creative Commons license, we will note that as well, include that in the statement. Um, we point people for further information to um, the Copyright Guide for Papers Past, which we need to review, and the copyright information on the Digital New Zealand website. For the unpublished collections, the right statements have basically been created in-house for those. Um, they reflect donor conditions, so again, there's more variety in them than is really desirable in terms of making them easy to understand by, by users. Uh, regarding change, yes, absolutely, we are planning on making change. The library's recently brought together a group of people to look at right statements and recommend a set of statements that can be used across all our collections, um, published, unpublished, digital and physical. Uh, and we are using as our starting point the right statements by DPLA Europeana, so um, we will probably make some public announcements about that when we've um, made our decisions. Yeah. Uh, so Auckland Museum is open by default, um, and what that means is that we follow the NZ Goal uh, framework, so we have a really good copyright framework that supports this whole concept, and it explains in detail the research behind each statement and why we're using it. We currently have one, two, three, four, five, five or six main statements that we use. Um, the first one is all rights reserved. Um, we have CC BY for images where we own the copyright to, and we release those um, under CC BY. We also have other Creative Commons licenses uh, chosen by the copyright owners. Uh, we use the copyright undetermined statement for orphan works. We have the no known copyright restrictions for public domain, mainly for 2D works. And we also have cultural permission statement for Māori and Pacific work, and this has been done um, in consultation with those direct communities. So we are hoping to review the statements possibly next year, particularly the cultural work statements. We really would love to open up some of that content either through a CC BY non-commercial licence um, or a CC BY, whatever they feel most comfortable with. Um, and we're also going to look at the DPLA rights in the near future because I think there's a lot of talk about that and we would like to be involved, so. Um, I think it was, was it last year, Victoria, that you, you got me to have a look at how many different rights statements that are used across all of the Digital New Zealand yep. content partners. Um, so I think back then we were at about 180 par partners and 33,000 different mm. rights statements um, in your, your rights metadata fields. So I think that um, there's a discussion to keep keep having and sharing the direction that we all go in. Donors. Do you ask copyright holders and copyright owning donors to consider adding Creative Commons licenses to their donations? And if so, how did it work? Do you want to kick um, off? I can you? answer that. Yes, we do. Um, we ask copyright holders and donors where possible uh, we make it clear that we're only licensing the image that we've taken of their work, not the actual work itself. We're quite open with our preferred Creative Commons license choices. Uh, we think it's a bit confusing for copyright owners um, to have copyright and then also the Creative Commons. So I have adapted Mark Crookston, I believe, wonderful um, 
pamphlet from the National Library uh, for copyright owners, um, Creative Commons licenses and copyright owners and donors. Um, so we send that out with the copyright letters and it's actually been more popular than a standard copyright agreement um, and the most preferred copyright statement is CC by NC, so non-commercial, um, and that is from our applied arts section. So as artists, they will ring me, they will say, what one should I choose? And I just kind of tell them, go, with, go through with them each statement and just say, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with, um, and a lot of them choose a non-commercial, which is absolutely fine. Um, we are still in the process of adding this link onto our website, but I've, um, we have around 500 objects that um, in our collection management system that have been tagged with that license, so they will be released soon. Um, yeah, so if, I mean, it's, there's very few institutions doing this at the moment. I know National Library is doing it. So we would love if anyone wants to do it or is doing it, um, please get in touch because it's really something that I think we should be thinking about just for the future. So, yeah. Yeah, um, certainly, the, um, yeah, we do ask people to um, assign Creative Commons licenses. The Turnbull Library discusses copyright ownership and licensing with all donors and the Creative Commons licences are part of the deed of gift um, that people complete as part of their donation. Um, it's been, the take up of it's been quite, um, quite slow and we think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that our own staff are still um, you know, developing their skills to be confident to have that licensing conversation with people and often donors um, either don't know whether they own the copyright mm. or they um, think they do and then when you tell them, for instance, that letters written to them uh, are not their copyright, they're the person who wrote the letters copyright, they, they start to get a bit um, spooked really about mm. perhaps their knowledge of copyright wasn't what they thought it was and um, maybe they are uh, not confident, they're a bit more cautious about saying yes they can assign um, a licence to it. But I think that's just something that will build over time and it's, um, we also have um, donation forms uh, that are on the website, we're just um, hopefully going to update those really soon and they will again also include all the Creative Commons licences. We, we offer the full suite of them, we don't suggest that they go for CC BY necessarily. Um, for the digitised newspapers and journals um, on Papers Past, this has worked really well for us except um, Tracy, who's down in the back room, room there, has said to me the ever-present issue of being unable to determine which articles are in copyright and subject to the licence and which ones are not. Um, it's a real headache in the newspaper world. Um, so far, when we've done this with people like Fairfax and that, we've managed to use the same CC licence, which is CC by non-commercial share alike, um, which is great because it's um, very preferable for users to avoid on that same platform having things with different licensing terms. Yeah. Uh, Tapapa doesn't do this yet. Um, we're thinking about it, uh, but again, um, some of the problems in terms of uh, the acquisitions team and um, education uh, and relationship clarity, the, also the, the donor or uh, vendor not necessarily owning the copyright in the work. Um, in fact, it's, it's more like, from Te Papa's collecting process, it's actually more likely that they're not the copyright holder. So it's... Um, it takes a bit of time to dive in um, to say to the acquisitions team, actually, no, no, for that one out of the ten that you're dealing with in the next month, that one we have to have a conversation about. Um, and there is a level of pro proactiveness you need to have internally to manage that. And to be honest, with the amount of resourcing I've got right now, it's just not entirely possible. I'd love to be able to do it. And I'm struggling to try and think of a way that I can get that done but I can't yet. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, then we'll open to the floor. If your organisation makes digital surrogates free for reuse, how do you promote it? And um, uh, do you have any hints for those who might be considering opening up their digital surrogates, their digital objects um, for, for of their collections for reuse? Uh, well, when we did it, we were quite lucky. Um, we had a really good press release. Uh, it was a slow news week. Um, 
the Herald picked it up, the Don Post didn't, but the Herald didn't did a, did a double page spread. We gave them our what we thought were our sexiest images to blow up and make beautiful on the on the spread, and it looked great. That caused a bit of a Twitter freak out from the um, the ministers at the time, which made us feel happy. Um, and uh, but following on from that, there was a bit of a peak there. Then it got picked up by other users in Twitter, and we got a second round as well, which is really great. Um, but following on from that, it's it's keeping that message out there that the material is available. We found that it's a constant surprise when you say, "Hey, you can come in and use this material." Hey, there's thirty five thousand images there that you can use with no problems. There's no known copyright restrictions against it. By all means, take it and use it. Um, and I, it, it's it's rare for me to come across somebody who's not in the sector that knows that that's available. Um, so how do we promote it? It's uh, when we get um, professional development for teachers. It's one of the things that's mentioned every time. I've got it as an email signature. Anytime anybody external emails me, that's on the bottom, in a bright, um, nice illustration. Um, yeah, and I've got to say, in my personal life, on my social media platforms, I'm forever pushing it to um, my wider circle. Uh, but I'm, I think that's a that's it's it's very similar from the question that um, Digital New Zealand asked at, at your breakfast. It's like, how do we promote Digital New Zealand? Same situation. How do you get it out of the sector? How do you get it out of our our bubble and out into the community to know that that it's available? And I think it's a real challenge, and I think that's something the whole sector is still struggling with. Um, yeah, the National Library does um, make um, these things available. Um, they on the website there you can find them, and there's a facet to find the free downloadable ones on the main search. But there's also a collection of all of them, so that you can just get quickly to all the images that are available for um, download. Um, they're also available on Flickr Commons and on Tumblr, and um, we quite often tweet about them. And if it's a really lovely image that we think is very um, attractive and catching, we will include that in the tweet as well. Um, when we first put the images up on Flickr Commons, we blogged about um, doing that, but we haven't done a lot of blogging about them since. So yeah, I think there's um, ways we could promote them more. Um, certainly, when we have to, when the research services staff have to turn people down in terms of wanting to use an image that they can't use, then this is a great opportunity that they use to say, "But there's all these other ones you can." Um, so. Um, this is one of my top priorities. Um, we are, I'm constantly putting all these amazing images online that are openly licensed, but how will people know that they're there? So we, work, we are working on a marketing press release. Um, we also have a remix program in the pipeline. Um, this will use collection metadata and images and hopefully be aimed at those demographics that don't physically visit the museum, but we're able to, um, they'll be able to use our content in new and creative ways and engage with the content through their screen, uh, which is fine. Um, and I just thought, you know, you talked about the New York um, Public Library. That is a really great example of how they marketed. They marketed so well that they got a whole article and stuff um, mm. about their open images mm. where we've been doing that. Well, a lot of museums have been doing that, or institutions have been doing that for many years. So, um, and just on that note, they've got a really good Twitter bot. You send them an emoji and yeah. it will ping you back a collection object that relates to that emoji. It's really cool. Mm. Um, so check it out, but they're just doing all these really cool things. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear anyone else's thoughts on how to do that because I think it's something that we all struggle with. So yeah. And um, Digital New Zealand's been trying to help along the way. So we um, we uh, helped set up and ran Gif It Up for I think it was two years, and then we were supporting it this year. So Gif It Up is a uh, competition with our um, counterparts in, at Europeana and Digital Public Library of America to encourage people to use um, openly licensed content to make gifts. Um, and th it's growing bigger and bigger every year and we all continue to support it and continue to push the New Zealand openly licensed content that we have in Digital New Zealand as well. So that's getting quite a lot of international recognition. All right, that's the end of the prepared questions. Time for questions from the floor. A bit of time. Um, there's one. Just behind you there. 
Um, sort of a question that I'm bringing up from a uh, PhD candidate at University of Canterbury, a chap called Jeff Field, who's um, doing his research on uh, Hansard parliamentary debates as a sort of linguistic corpus. He's recently, dis well, we've recently discovered that uh, Google's digitised uh, Hansard back 1850s through to about 1980s, which I wasn't aware of until quite recently. Um, but they've done uh, di Google digitised public domain, so we can't play with that content. But given that it's Hansard, does anyone on the panel, did A, they know that that had been done, and B, how can we help Jeff play with that content? Just a start of a 10. I didn't know it had been done. Oh, Tracy? Tracy? <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. You should be up here too. Um, just from the point of view of the material that's been done by Google and also the Hearty Trust in the States, um, I work for the National Library and we've digitised a lot of the appendices to the journals of the House of Representatives, um, but we've kind of stopped at 1950 because um, the Hearty Trust have done um, the ATJs from like 1945 to 1970, so we have been negotiating extremely slowly and intermittently with them um, to open access to this content because um, I'm not aware of the legal complexities, but they apply different, more restrictive copyright to non-American material for some reason. And so the potential is that um, if you want to open access to Hansard, if you get, I imagine the Office of the Clerk are the own, official, own, well the House of Representatives is potentially the official owner of the material, but um, the Office of the Clerk, certainly for the ATJs, acts as the steward, and they potentially, if they can get access opened as the owner working with the Hearty Trust, then your student may be able to get access to that data. So I suggest that you approach, is it available in the, it's in the Hearty Trust, isn't it? Yes. That you actually approach the Hearty Trust Well, they'll, they'll need the rights owner, and that yeah. potentially is the Office of the Clerk. Um, but certainly from our position, it's been quite a slow piece of work, but that might be more due to our lack of constant pushing than them. I think others might want to access well, yeah. but, but I mean, that, that is an issue for us, is that there's a lot of New Zealand material that's already been digitised, so do we put our effort into trying to open access to that, or do we just mm. duplicate the effort? Thanks, so thanks for answering that one, Tracy. Um, Mark, and then, then I see you there as well. I asked this on Twitter, so I might as well ask it to you guys. Um, <laughs> is there value in uh, us as a broad sector um, having a single voice on copyright reform? Um, there's maybe some pros and cons in that, but you can just answer yes or no. And if it's yes, how do you think we go about um, getting that single voice? I think it's worth our having a discussion about having a single voice. Um, we may find that actually the devil's in the detail and that a single voice is not necessarily going to serve us well. I know that Lianza has been, um, we've made suggestions to the Lianza um, leadership um, team and exec council that um, we certainly approach um, other parts of the glam sector to have those conversations about what we would be looking for from copyright reform so that we can see where the areas of common ground are and I think that it's not one of those all or nothing we can have a common voice on on things where we have got a common agenda and, and support other ones here. Yeah. Um, oh, I just, on that question, I, I agree with you in some ways, but I also think that the more submissions or letters or whatever we can throw at government is probably going to make it be heard maybe louder, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I think we all have different things, libraries and museums are quite different, we deal with a variety of objects um, that all require different kinds of legislation changes um, so my view would be that if people want to make submissions or 
that we can work together as a working group um, and maybe it's like different templates that we all kind of sign our name to or different types of letters but um, yeah it's a hard one I think. Yeah I think that's a really important point that um, if we're going to have speak the same voice on issues we need to speak multiple times I mean we all mm. need to mm. send it in and there are other partners uh, that are very natural partners for us people like Internet New Zealand um, Creative Commons uh, yeah and we've been uh, we just recently the Leanza Copyright Committee actually had a face-to-face -face meeting in Wellington recently and we tried to meet up with some of those people and actually have those conversations and start them here Oh, my question is around DMCA takedowns, which kind of ties in with fair use. Um, so I'm just going to use video games as an example. So if I recorded my gameplay session and cut the video, put in all sorts of work, maybe added in a little bit of commentary to it, is it still privy to you know being taken down? On it YouTube, dep it depends on what platform you post it. If you post it on YouTube, for example, that's an American platform. Ergo, American law is not. It's not New Zealand law. Um, the DMCA is an American act, so that's what you've got to work with. Um, if yeah, it's uh, the one of the key issues with copyright worldwide is that it's jurisdictional, depending on which country you're in, and consequently the internet doesn't really it has its issues <laughs> you oh, know it yeah. doesn't fit so it means that it means that you have to look at things simple things like well okay who actually we're at, under what law is the platform I'm posting on um, ruled by and for, for the majority of the social media platforms they're American and consequently American law applies and um, which, which is it's not such a bad thing I mean you can at least challenge under fair fair use yeah. when you know, instead of fair dealing, so there's an upside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know, because, um, I mean, by that logic, doesn't that mean that every single digital content on YouTube is, you know, can be taken down by DMCA notices? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I don't know, it might be slightly off the um, radar a bit, but in terms of copyright, Recently, where I work, we had to do an image search, and it suddenly made me realize that I'm just as good as anybody else. I put my photos on Flickr, and there's an awful lot of people out there who put their photos on Flickr just under Creative Commons. And of course, that can just be reused anywhere without necessarily being told because image for reuse, blah de blah. Do you think there's a, a place in terms of the glam sector, just in terms of just putting out a little bit of basic knowledge out there so that the people realise that their photo might one day appear on this big poster, you know, unattributed to them, and they've got the original um, sitting Well, if it's a Creative phone. Commons licence, then they're breaching the terms of the licence if they don't attribute it. But yes, um, if somebody prints a T-shirt with your image on it and they've got the attribution mm. underneath the image, they're sweet, yeah. um, mm. depending on what licence you've picked. Yeah. Um, but yes, but I, I, think I, I think in terms of education, I know that Creative Commons Aotearoa does a lot of, uh, you know, is, is working with the education sector. Yeah. It's, they've got a whole stream of work in terms of education, the, educating the public about Creative Commons licensing. And I think GLAMs have a, a, a role to play in that, but I think it's going to take more than just us talking about Creative Commons licensing oh, to, no. to educate people about Creative Commons licensing and copyright generally. Yeah. No, no, I realise that, but I was just thinking there's actually nothing, you know. I mean, I, I work in the library sector. I mean, copyright is bigger my, big my library world. But even I hadn't really thought that, hey, you know, Possibly my photo could pop up somewhere unattributed to me, and it, you know, being I mean, a little a person. There's a amount of infringement yeah. online that's yeah. going to happen regardless. If you take a really great image, um, somebody's going to take it and use it. If you, you know, if it, if you make it publicly available on the internet, it's likely that that will happen. The but that's where you come down to. Well, if it, it wants, it depends on how you and how you feel about your images. Um, my sister's a really great citizen scientist. She does everything CC0 if she can because she wants everybody to use her stuff. Mm. So, you know, she she wants to receive everything as CC0 and she gives everything away as CC0. So it's, um, it's, it's very much... Um, you, you can't... 
I look at it and think it's it's like us taking responsibility for other people's rights. They there's a certain amount of of responsibility that the rights holder has to take in terms of self-education, in terms of finding out this information. I've had 10 years of having to learn this stuff so that we can be on the right side of the rules. And I really feel that you know people have to take some responsibility for themselves as well and their content. Um, it would be it's so much more helpful if you get a knowledgeable person on the other side of the table. Um, whereas if you're doing a negotiation and they don't know what their rights are, it's really difficult to have to do the education and then do the negotiations after you've done the education because you always feel that maybe they'll think that I'm telling fibs or maybe they think they'll see my bias or, you know, and it's it's hard to have that. So, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I do think that there's, there's certainly a role to play in terms of educating people more about copyright and about Creative Commons licensing or any type of copyright licensing, but... Um, I, I really don't think it's just up to us. People have to sort of start, yeah, really, yeah. It's a core element of digital literacy. Yeah. Um, and yeah. That, that's well beyond our sector as well, it's the education sector and, and others. Yeah. Last question, because it's afternoon tea time. Unless you want to stay and talk about copyright. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe this question's primarily for Fee and Victoria. Um, do you think the NC provision of Creative Commons is really fit for purpose when you've got this tension between not wanting to have your work out there for stock photo libraries to make money off or people putting it on shower curtains, et cetera, et cetera, um, but at the same time, if you do that, then that locks you out of things like Wikimedia, uh, Wikimedia and Wiki Commons and that sort of thing. There seems to be a really fundamental tension there and with uh, DNZ encouraging NC licences, are you, how are you approaching that? Yeah, open that, that's possible. so. Um, but people. Do you mean for the metadata? For, for anything people are licensing, yeah. because um, there's really good reasons why you want to um, uh, not have an NC license yeah. from our perspective, but also you can see why creators see really good reasons for having an NC license, but you know, there seems to be a middle ground that's missing perhaps. I don't think there is a middle ground. I think the tension is there. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to restrict non-commercially, then you have to realise that you're cutting yourself out of the game of the cool shit too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's a pragmatic response. I think it's, uh, I mean, we have an NC licence, you know, an NC, and it does make things difficult for some of the platforms that we would love to be part of. But at the same time, there's a reason we've picked that. Um, and we still have to work through that and unpick it. You know, at what point are we going to decide that the the negatives aren't big enough to keep us there? You know, that that we can actually it's it's a weighing up situation and, and eventually, you know, maybe we'll we'll leap off that cliff and take that dive. I don't I but at what point that happens, I don't know. And yeah, so yeah, this I have concerns about the NC in some ways, but that's the essay this year I like that I kind of does my head in a little as well yeah, yeah. because yeah, some of those licenses don't fit together um, and if you're requiring one to be non-commercial, you can't remix it with a commercial one because it has to have that license and that... Yeah. Like we have we have difficulty with the no derivatives as well because yeah. I mean we picked that license and then and then like a year later we're going to go oh but we want people to change our work, the work mm -hmm. we want people to be able to make other artworks and and engage with this in a creative way and we've just shut that door did anybody think of that no mm -hmm. okay we might need to revisit that you know and it's 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 that type of situation where it's where if you choose the more restrictive license you've got to take the good with the bad you're protecting your rights but the bad part of it is is that you're shutting yourself out of further engagement with the user base but you can if you do go for the more restrictive license you do have the option of opening it yes more that's yeah. the good thing yeah, about it yeah the good it. thing about it is you, you're not stuck there yeah. you're not stuck there you can actually add another creative more you know creative content more if open it's more license open. Oh, yeah. yeah if it's more open you can go more follow your path down that open route You've all stayed. Okay. Rock on, people. <laughs> Can we done. thank the panellists? Um, and then, thank you. And I'm sure we're all open to you coming and chatting to us um, and go have afternoon tea. <laughs> <laughs>